I'm writing this as a warning and because frankly I feel like I want someone to understand what happened and why I did what I did. My name is Mark Miller. I'm a groundskeeper and guardian of the Colts estate found on the outskirts of the small town of Ikarvik. Getting this job was a peculiar process, but not unheard of for an eccentric lord or baron. Deliver a letter of intent in the mailbox of the property, then check back in three days to see if I was hired. It was meant to be a temporary job that would end months of unemployment after a messy separation, which drained me of all my energy and resources, forcing me to find a new direction in life. I needed to buy myself some time and financial safety before moving away and starting over. There wasn't anything really worth sticking around for in this town, and being the caretaker of the Colts estate gave me some much needed breathing room before deciding what my next step should be. The job paid very well, and it didn't require much expertise or real effort. The best part was that I could sleep there, allowing me to put aside the money I would have spent on rent. I've never met Miss Julia Colts, but after laying eyes on her estate, I started to imagine her as a wealthy and educated lady, one who appreciated history and its beauty, while embracing modernity with enthusiasm and curiosity. Her manor was built on a wide, flat meadow, surrounded by lush trees and a beautiful view of the Ember Crown Mountains. It's an isolated and quiet place, which I appreciate. The gates were unlocked, as promised, and I made my way down the wide cobblestone path towards the building, passing the three decorative fountains and a very well-kept yard. The winding gravel walkways surrounding the rest of the property led me to the shade located on the right side, where I found everything I needed for the job, as well as a simple bed and dresser. After settling in, I took a stroll around the place. It proved to be pleasant and all I had to do was patrol the grounds every hour during the night before exploring the buildings and its numerous rooms, making sure everything was in order. If there were any updates, requests or payments that needed to be fulfilled, the mailbox would be the agreed upon method of communication and exchange. My first few nights were uneventful and I took the time to slowly develop a routine while discovering all the interesting things this place had on display. The path took me from the main entrance to the gate, around the entire edge of the property, with longer pauses at each corner to check the fence for any signs of trouble. I was to make sure the light sources were lit and illuminated the area properly, leaving no darkness for any would-be intruder to hide in. After that, I went back inside, following the hallways and rooms as they were laid out in a similar clockwise pattern. I would randomly choose to reverse the direction, to confuse anyone who would think to take advantage of my obvious patrol habits. At least that's what I wanted to say if I was ever asked to prove my effectiveness and dedication to the mission at hand, but in reality, I just wanted some variety to keep the boredom away. The art pieces and collectibles were clearly the main residence of the estate, as well as the most important, and I grew fond of being their watchful guardian every night. No one ever came to visit, not even gardeners or cleaners, so it often felt like I was the only one caring about the place. I even took it upon myself to care for the greenery every once in a while. Sometimes I imagined myself as a lonely ghost haunting the land I lived on, never to interact with another being and always looking for something that will never be found. Thoughts like those kept me entertained enough to not fall asleep or drown in boredom. Coffee can only do so much and working the graveyard shift isn't exactly a schedule that I'm used to. A couple of weeks went by and I found an envelope in the mailbox of the estate. I did another round around the property and went inside to make myself comfortable at my station. Inside I find a few pages from a court record detailing the trial of one Bethany Dallas who was accused of torture and murder of her husband Matthew. 
Many words were used to describe his achievements in life, from business ventures that dealt primarily in metals to charity work involving orphan children. His wife of almost two decades fell ill at one point and being alone most of the time due to Matthew being away, started a quick and dramatic descent towards psychosis. She fired the staff, started to disturb the peace in the neighborhood in various ways, at one point running naked through the streets wearing only a scarlet scarf around her head and generally refused any help or allowing friends and family into her home. When her husband finally returned from his latest trip, she welcomed him with a club over his head, dragging him into the basement, keeping him locked for months, frequently torturing and abusing him. When his relatives and acquaintances became worried of his sudden and prolonged absence, they came looking for him. That's when Bethany decided to end her husband's life by dousing him in gas while he was unconscious from a recent beating and leaving a candle burning. She then promptly left the man to be consumed by flames. The article did not mention anything about her having children or what the outcome of the trial was, but the tone was one of disbelief and shock. These were a strange bunch of papers to receive, and they clearly weren't from Miss Coles, but I welcomed the chance to read about an intriguing story. The stillness of the night was interrupted by a distant sound coming from what I initially thought was a few rooms away from where I was reading. I slowly placed them down on the mahogany table as my hearing became focused on that strange, shuffling noise. It had an intermittent pattern, unlike any critter that might have gotten inside or unexpected sound from the bones of such a big house settling but the short taps followed by long, scratching sounds continued. It was akin to a broom being dragged on a cloth or a rug. Whatever it was, it raised the hair on the back of my neck. As I slowly made my way towards the source of the sound, making sure my steps were light as a feather, I realized it was moving away from me. Walking from room to room, a sound was always at about the same distance away. After a few good minutes of following it, I started trying to convince myself that I was just hearing things or that the sound came from outside. Maybe trees and bushes rustling in the wind, combined with an overactive imagination and lack of proper sleep, made me scare myself into thinking there was someone or something in the building with me, toying with my mind while I followed it in the dark. Uh, it was almost time for another round of patrolling, so I pulled myself together, pushing the disturbance as far back in my mind as I could, made my way back to my post to get my things and go about my shift in the cool, quiet darkness of the moonlit Colts estate. A few nights later, I was slowly making my way through the halls and rooms of the building, taking the time to appreciate the collection of interesting art pieces, statues and tapestries, which Miss Colts dedicated this entire building to. It was hard for me to grasp or understand the need to collect so many, really. There were some beautiful displays of craftsmanship, mastery and human expression, of course, but I connected with just a handful. The most captivating one was the portrait of a woman with dark hair, pale skin, intense grey eyes, wearing red lipstick and a necklace made of probably hundreds of small red rubies. She was staring to her left with a cold and distant demeanor, in what seemed to be either deep contemplation or strong disdain. Regardless, it was one of the more well-crafted paintings in the entire Colts collection. I made a point to sit and admire it often, as it always intrigued and charmed me with its beauty. I can't seem to find a signature or a title written anywhere, though. Too bad, I would have liked to see more work from this artist. The shuffling sound from the night before returned, startling and making me aware of a strong, pungent odor filling the room. While I stumbled towards safety, my mind rushed to identify the smell of gas or, more likely, turpentine, just before the dizziness almost brought me to my knees. The door swung open and my hands let go of the doorknobs just in time to stop me from crashing face first onto the front deck of the mansion. The chill, crisp air filled my lungs, 
and rushed precious oxygen to my brain, making me aware of how much I was shaking, panic bringing me close to tears as I heaved onto the stone slabs. My throat and nose were in pain, stinging from the toxic fumes I inhaled in my mad dash towards safety. A careful investigation revealed no answers. The smell itself was almost completely gone. When my condition improved, I returned to my normal schedule and I was surprised to find another envelope in the mailbox. Curious to see if there was any more interesting information that would continue the story I learned so far, I opened it and sat on the steps of the main entrance, still too afraid to get back inside the manor. These notes were handwritten, seemingly torn from someone's journal. A few of the pages recounted the everyday life of a woman who seemed to struggle with loneliness, lamenting over precious memories and long lost dreams. Other pages were more passionate and incoherent, speaking of letters found, hidden away or delivered by mail. Opening them despite being addressed to her husband caused her whole world to come crashing down. There's one piece of a torn letter, clearly written by someone else, that says, My golden-haired princess, I will gladly let the flames of passion envelop me, as my love for you is true and everlasting. Let us wait no longer for the moment we can truly be together and run towards our future. A strange and disappointing batch of scraps, but even though I was still shaken up from the night's events, I found the strength and courage to get back to my duties and pray for daytime to come sooner. The next few nights were difficult. I started having trouble sleeping during the day and when I did, it was interrupted and agitated. I constantly felt there was someone right around the corner or at the foot of my bed watching me. My rounds were becoming slower, feeling the need to always investigate or look around for minutes before finding the courage to continue my walk. I was unsure if the countless cups of coffee were making things worse, but having so few hours of healthy sleep while covering the graveyard shift was starting to affect me. Another envelope. At least whoever was in the mood to spend so much energy dropping random pieces of paper in people's mailboxes was keeping me distracted. A gazette from long ago with torn edges on weather paper spoke of the new warehouse built by renowned agricultural tycoon Joseph Colts the latest humanitarian deed in a series of investments and projects that revolved around helping the underprivileged. He also offered all able-bodied people that he housed a job in his fields for extra income. He spoke of his humble beginnings and work ethic, highlighting a typical rags-to-riches story that felt a bit inflated but touching nonetheless. The text also said he would be embarking on a tour of the country in the following weeks interested in bringing his business to other locations and communities. His wife, the article mentions, would not be joining him, as they recently welcomed a newborn into the world. This is freaking me out. These were targeted, meant to be found by someone living on this property. I haven't heard back from Miss Julia in almost a fortnight. Even if my letters that recounted my recent tribulations and pleas for information were sent properly. Was someone trying to reach her? Or were they trying to reach me? I felt like I kept falling asleep either at my station or in the middle of my rounds. I kept forgetting how I got there or how long I'd been in that spot. It was a heavy weight on my soul that pushed me down every step I took. Coffee didn't do anything anymore. My eyes throbbed and my head pleading for reprieve. And that damn sound that cursed its shuffling kept startling me at random hours in the night. I woke up staring at the portrait at one point. Just staring at her powerful and mysterious presence. 
Sometimes it felt like the entire building was built to protect her, with the rest of the collection acting as decoys or bowing under her intense gaze. And I felt small and powerless in her presence. Ashamed. Now I keep notes of my tribulations in life at the Gold's estate. I wrote down what I remember happening up until this point and hope to keep track of the events going forward, just to ease my mind and keep track. It's a long way to go before I recover fully. Another set of scraps appeared today in the mailbox. In the few moments of lucidity I got from the coffee kicking in and the cold mountain air coming through the fields, I started reading. The tone and clarity of these diaries were strange, but a quick comparison confirms that they come from the same woman who is dealing with a revelation brought on by letters she had no business in reading. In this almost full entry, she details a day spent with a local painter, whom she became infatuated with. He offered to paint her portrait, to which she agreed, starting a period of a few days of visits to work on the project. After almost a week of this, he suddenly mentions that he was engaged, and that his soon-to-be wife will be visiting them shortly. The woman felt ashamed and heartbroken, realizing her feelings were not reciprocated, but wanted to finish the painting. The woman goes on to describe meeting the fiancé. She had beautiful gold hair that reached her collarbone with the grace and exuberance of youth enhancing her joyous presence. A dark red scarf swung over her right shoulder and forearm as she reached her hand towards her husband's client, introducing herself and waiting for a reply that never came. As I was engrossed in what I was reading, I heard the sound again. It was closer this time. Whenever I pass her, it feels like she turns, fixing her dreadful eyes upon me in dense judgment. Sometimes I try to catch the movement, but I never do, while most times I try my best to ignore it. I even tried locking her room completely, but the doors never remained closed when I got back to her. My mind is playing tricks on me, and I'm convinced there's something wrong with this house. Making a man hear and smell strange things and lose track of time is the work of something beyond my understanding. I feel like only paranoia and fear keep me awake nowadays. Trying to wake myself up and snap out of the fear and confusion that were plaguing my mind, I threw some cold water on my face. When the water settled, my slowly decreasing breathing suddenly stopped. As I saw the reflection of my face turning gray and ashy with blistering skin and orange light engulfing my body, I pushed myself away from the nightmare, hitting the chair and wall behind me and landing on the floor on the hallway. As I touched my face in a desperate attempt to understand what happened, I found no damage, no blisters or ash, just my tired, sweating face crying in maddening confusion and terror. My voice echoed in the silence of this dreadful place with only her indifferent face as my witness. The latest envelope sent shivers down my spine. An article that speaks of the passing of Mr. Joseph Colts in a tragic accident on his way to one of his plantations up north. His carriage caught fire, trapping him inside, along with two other people. Another list of accomplishments is presented as to honor his life and good deeds, but there is also mentions of his highlights as a socialite, having dinners with powerful men and women from around the country. There are other pieces of text that seem much more recent, speaking of horrible living conditions and treatment in the cold living spaces built for the poor, with many unreported horrible incidents and cover-ups. An investigation was underway. I smell the turpentine again. <laughs> I received a single note from Miss Coles, the first one in months. It said, let the fires of passion make you an honest man. I have no clue what she means. It's 
this some sort of game that she enjoys playing, locking someone within the walls of her abandoned collection of junk and sending them cryptic notes? Was she sending me these envelopes? To what end? I have no patience to play senseless games. I have decided the money I gathered is enough to get me out of here. The sleep deprivation and the nights filled with anxiety are not worth it anymore, especially if she finds it funny to toy with me. Tomorrow will be my last night. I should receive the latest payment in the mailbox and that's when I'll leave. She can protect her own hoard of worthless treasures and maybe learn to keep her nose out of other people's business. The sound of scraping, it was in my shed last night. Worse in my head, like something scratching the inside of my skull trying to escape. I couldn't sleep and the constant feeling of someone watching me kept me on edge. I feel like I'm losing my mind. This damned woman and her manner, I just want to get out of here and find some peace and quiet. A huge manor at the edge of town, left to its own devices, for some poor schmuck to take care of while she's out who knows where, with who knows what damn bastard she's trying to replace her late husband with. She hired me to guard her manor without telling me anything about the damn property, or what it does to a person when they spend so much time here. And I'm risking my health and sanity for her amusement while she sends cryptic messages and paper cutouts of articles meant to unnerve me? And I, I saw someone inside the manor, a, a tall woman dressed in a dark long dress, dragging something by a dark red scarf. I didn't see more than that. As soon as I registered what my eyes were seeing, I bolted. With the doors of the manor wide open and a crowbar in hand, I yelled, trying to find out who got in, but hoping no one answered. In fact, either possibility was terrifying, and my heart was beating so hard I could barely focus on anything else. Until the dragon came rushing towards me from behind. I woke up much later, when the sun was already out and the day was young. The hard wooden floor of the manor creaked as I slowly got up with a terrible headache. My gaze fell upon the portrait in front of me. Somehow, I was inside the house, in the room of the ruby woman, just watching me in quiet content. Desperation took over me and I started screaming to let the fear and confusion out, cursing the very grounds of this wretched place while occasionally laughing at my own outburst. I started directing my anger at the painting, taking it off the wall and throwing it around the room then picking up whatever else I could lay my hands on and doing my best to destroy the painting. I felt it was a source for the activity or just a good enough representation of the entire building the reason for my plight. When my rage subsided, I sat outside on the steps and started writing these notes. I feel drained and scared, hanging on by a thread. The past few months have been a nightmare. And I realize now the hand I had in this. The separation was caused by my lover after she found through a misplaced letter that I fell for another. That moment led me down this path, and this house seems to try and destroy the last bit of hope I had left, but it won't. She might have found out some things about my past, but I don't care what Julia's deal is anymore. There is something evil within these walls. The smell of turpentine permeates the house now. The pungent smell doesn't affect me that much this time, as it gives me an idea. The entire place is a monument to lost dreams and mistakes, sculptures of frozen moments, paintings of deep regret and melancholic contemplation, an echo of the lives the collection represents or tries to evoke. Things meant to pass 
and be forgotten. A tomb. More appropriately, a funeral pyre. Just waiting to be lit. The candle's flame will reach the fuel I laid on the ground in around an hour, buying me enough time to leave. If only the shuffling around me would stop for a second so I could finish my thoughts. My name was Mark Miller. I was a groundskeeper and guardian at the Coles estate, and you won't find me again. I will burn away the past and take this place with it. I'm leaving these notes inside the mailbox. To whoever finds them, stay away from the Coles family. Actually, stay away from nobles, especially their widows. And to Julia Coles, well, if you find this, I hope you...